Bible says that uh, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And I'm glad that you and I, we have the victory this evening. And, uh, and I'm going to be real honest with you as you're making your way to Mark chapter number 10. I'm going to be honest with you. I thought for sure I tried my best to get away from this thought. And I know uh, I really feel impressed of the Lord to preach on this this evening. But I want, to, I want the church to understand that I guess there's times when a preacher enjoys preaching. Man, there's times I love it. Because there's some subjects that's a whole lot easier to preach on than others. And have y'all ever tried to avoid having a conversation with somebody? Have y'all ever tried to avoid, you know, you, you try every way in the world to get around them. And uh, I, I, I've really, to be honest with you, that's kind of how I've done, I've done this, this message. I've, I've sat downstairs all evening and I've told the Lord every excuse and under the sun why I don't want to preach this. And I don't. But I feel like, and it ain't, once we get into it, you're going to realize that I ain't jumping on us. I ain't, I ain't. But I believe that if we'll take heed to what the Bible says, it'll help us to be the people that God desires us to be. And it'll help us to be free from any fears that the, the devil tries to place on us. And uh, I want to I wanna say, well, we'll get into that in a moment, but... But uh, it, 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 sometimes I argue with the Lord. Sometimes it's with a heavy heart that you preach on things. And this is one of those times. But Mark chapter number 10, we're going to read one verse, and we read it this morning. And, uh, and I, I hope that this message will be received uh, with grace, knowing that uh, there's a responsibility laid on a pastor to lead. And I believe it's needful and it's necessary as an under-shepherd. You lead by example. And you, you're, you're there to go before the sheep. And uh, I'd never intentionally uh, ever try to lead the church in a direction that I didn't feel like it was the Lord's will for us to go there. Amanda's looking at me like, where are we going this evening? And uh, But Mark chapter number 10. Look with me at verse number 42. We read this in your hearing this morning. And we're going to sort of reiterate this verse very briefly. I'm going to give you a few thoughts that I pray that you will think upon. And then I'm going to give you three thoughts that pertain to uh, the message. So stay with me to the end. I got a big introduction. So Mark chapter number 10, verse number 42, But Jesus called them to him, and saith unto them, You know that they which are counted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. As we made mention of in this morning's message, Jesus is using the mentality and the philosophy of the Gentile leaders who not only in his day but in our day by want of power exercise lordship and rule with unbridled authority toward their people. And can I say this evening, I want to key in on that thought of unbridled authority. We're living in one of the greatest nations that the world knows, and I want to I want to emphasize that this evening. I, brother Bill, uh, wouldn't want to live anywhere else in the world than America, and I'm thankful that you and I we do have the liberty uh, uh, to be able to come in here tonight and without any fear of uh, man and what man might do or what man might say. I'm glad. Uh, that we can gather into the church house this evening uh, and to be able to worship the Lord as we see fit. Uh, and I'm thankful that there are some principles laid out in the documents that this country is founded upon uh, of separation of church and state. Uh, 
uh, and I and I let me uh, let me say that when they laid those principles out, that wasn't to keep the church out of state affairs, but it was to keep the state out of church affairs. And I am thankful for our Bill of Rights and the the, the First Amendment. It guarantees us a, a religious liberty, and the, the the very amendment states that Congress shall make no law in respect of worshiping the Lord. I'm glad that you and I, uh, we have a God-given right this evening to gather into this place of worship. And if they will, when I say they, I'm talking about leaders and I'm talking about rulers. If they uh, will respect our Constitution and the Bill of Rights, they ain't nothing they can do to keep us from what we're doing this evening. And I'm glad of that. I thank God that we live in a place as of now that we can worship the Lord. But we're preaching tonight on having faith in a fear-filled day. Having faith in a fear-filled day. As I think about the nation of America, we have for as long as I've been alive and no doubt as long as you've been alive, we have enjoyed liberties that many other nations and countries in the world do not enjoy. We have freedom. And as we were sitting down there this evening, we understand that that freedom... It did not come free, and I thank God for the men and the women alike that, listen, was willing to leave their families behind and pick up a gun and go fight to secure our freedom. I'm thankful for the men that we have in this church and the women alike that have fought to preserve the liberties that you and I enjoy. Listen, there has been bloodshed and there has been wars fought brother Bill uh, uh, the liberty that we enjoy it didn't come free blood was shed for this liberty that we have can I say that blood was shed uh, when this nation was founded when they realized that they wanted to excommunicate themselves from the from England and they wanted to come over here and start them a nation There was bloodshed when this nation was founded. There was bloodshed when the Constitution was penned and put into place. And there's been bloodshed down through time to preserve that document that this nation is founded upon. But the nation of America, we've enjoyed the liberties that many other countries do not enjoy. And when I say that, many other countries, as a matter of fact, every country except the nation of Israel is a Gentile nation. And I understand that our democracy is unlike any other government in all the world. There's not another government that has lasted as long as America has lasted. Uh, There's not another founding document that has stood the test of time like the Constitution. Uh, uh, But I'm I'm fearful that we're we're, we're drawing closer to a day when America is becoming more like other countries than what I really am comfortable with, Brother Jay. I really feel like, and and there's something, but we're going somewhere with this. Y'all stay with me tonight because I'm going to get down here to the meat of the message and you're going to realize it ain't half as bad as probably what I've made it out to be, but my heart's been heavy as I've watched this year transpire. My heart has been heavy. My mind has been racked. I've laid in bed at night as I have watched everything that has went on in our country and in our nation and not only in our nation but it has trickled down uh, to now it is in our backyard and I want to say that I'm afraid that the political characters of our day 
those, in, and I listen, this ain't got nothing. Let me go ahead and say this. It has nothing to do with Republican or Democrat. I'm not being political tonight. It ain't not got nothing to do with the right or the left. I'm saying every one of them. Brother Bill, every one of them. I'm afraid is nothing more than a reflection of the illustration that Christ gives his disciples. My greater fear is this, and what I see happening is that the people are nothing more than the pawns that's being used in the games that our political leaders are playing in Washington. And I know that's, that's heavy stuff tonight, and I know it's a Sunday night, and they ain't but a handful of us here, and there's people watching, uh, by the way, the internet at home, but I'm afraid of... Uh, that as we see the things transpiring around us, that our leaders are, are growing ever more like the leaders that Jesus spoke about and how that they exercise unbridled authority on their people. And so with that in mind, I, I want to I say tonight that there's going to be some things, as I said this morning, I didn't really get into much of it, but, but there may be some things I say this evening in passing that we may not all agree on. But I believe when we get down to the meat of the message, there's going to be some things that we can all agree on. And if you're watching by way of the Internet at home this evening, I want you to stay with us. Don't turn us off. You stay with us to the end because I believe it'll help us. When I say we're living and what we have saw in this year, I believe with all my heart we have saw what would be defined as fear-mongering. Now, I want to preface this that I understand. Brother Scott, he's here tonight. Him and Miss Linda, they... Brother Scott's had the virus. Miss Annette's had the virus. And there's many within our brother Greg's had the virus. And I don't want anybody to leave here tonight saying, well, preacher, you're making light of my situation. No. No, my mama laid in the hospital for two weeks with the virus. We was all scared to death of her getting that virus. We all wondered what it'd be like if she got the virus. We wondered about what was going to happen. We've all, listen, we've watched this year transpire, and I believe that there is an agenda and there's some, there's some things going on behind the scenes. This thing's bigger, Brother Bill, than what we realize. I want to say, number one, we see as it relates to our rulers, there is some spiritual antichrists among us. As it relates to rulers, the Bible says that there is spiritual wickedness in high places. You know what that is? That's talking about in leadership positions. Uh, uh, we're living in a day and time where you can't trust what any politician has to say. We're living in a day and time where this year I've seen some things said I thought would never be said by men I thought would never say them. And I am quickly losing uh, uh, my confidence in both sides of the aisle. There's spiritual antichrist. First John 2.18 says, Little children, it is the last time. He's talking about it's the last days. He said, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, that's the man, anti, the Antichrist that will rise up out of the sea. We understand that that's going to take place during the seven-year tribulation. We understand that there is going to be a literal Antichrist rise up, and we've seen him in Revelation chapter 6. We understand that when he comes on the scene, he'll be a real man with real prerogatives, and he's going to come in riding upon a white horse. It's a real person. And so John says that you've heard that Antichrist shall come even now. Even now are there many Antichrist, plural, whereby we know that it is the last time. And then we see 1 John 4, 3 says, 
This is that spirit of Antichrist whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. Can I say that there is a spirit, I really believe, behind a lot of what we've saw transpire this year uh, uh, that is motivated by the spirit of Antichrist. Brother Bill, I believe we've saw some things that's happened this year that is the setting up of the stage to give rise to the Antichrist. That when his time has come, I realize that the church is going to be called out. You and I were leaving out Revelation 4 1. Come up hither. There's going to be a shout come from another world. The trump of God's going to sound. The dead in Christ's going to rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be changed in a moment. The trickle of an eye, I realize I'm not looking for the undertaker, I'm looking for the upper taker. All those things are true, but the reality is we see the stage is being set for when his time shall come, they will flock to the man known as Antichrist. We see those stages being set. We see the spirit of the Antichrist at work. We see and we realize that they are some motivating powers behind the decisions I believe that has been made this year that are contrary to God and His Word. Amen. Amen. So we see that we come to the realization that there are spiritual Antichrists all around us. There are individuals <laughs> then I believe with all my heart within the political realm and the leadership realm of our nation, not only of our nation, but that also of the whole world, there are some uh, political individuals that I believe are motivated by the spirit of the Antichrist. The Bible uh, uh, defines that very clearly. It illustrates that very plainly. But then I see that when spiritual antichrists, when they begin to rise up within the leadership realm of not only our nation and our world, what it does is it begins to uh, develop or we begin to see a sinister agenda. And I want to say tonight that I believe as I have watched this year transpire, as I have saw it develop, as I have seen these things come to pass, I see more and more that there is a sinister agenda behind a lot of what we've heard what we've saw on TV and what we've been told. Uh, uh, can I say that we are seeing the development of a sinister agenda that is uh, just like the spirit of Antichrist that's setting the stage. Uh, can I say the agenda that's been laid out before us is also, I believe, just a stepping stone that has been laid toward the rise of the Antichrist. I say we're, we have met a year of global deception. We're talking about that sinister agenda. There's, a, there's a, an aspect of that agenda. I believe we're, 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 we're living in a day we have saw a year of global deception. Now, I want to slow down. I want to be real careful, and I want to tread very lightly right here. But at the same time, I want to say some things about what we have been told. If you believe everything that you've heard on the news, then I have some oceanfront property in Gatlinburg I'll sell you. And I say that lightheartedly, and I want us to, and listen, I love you tonight, and I wouldn't say anything that offend anybody, but listen, we're living in a day where when the Antichrist rises up to power, the Bible said that they'd believe a lie, that they would, God would send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. A lie, and I realize he ain't come to power yet because we ain't out of here yet, and I know we ain't going to be here when he does, uh, but what we see on a global scale 
is unlike anything we've ever seen before. On a global scale, Brother Jay, I've never seen it like what we've seen this past year. And y'all remember a, a while back we was talking, and I know, I'm, and listen, I'm, I'm, for, I'm for if you want to wear a mask. I know Brother Jay's wearing, or Brother Jay, Brother Scott, see, here we go. I'm getting my deacons mixed up again. And I know Brother Scott, he's wearing one night. Miss Linda, she's wearing one. And, and he's doing that, so he ain't coughing on that. But he ain't got COVID, but he does probably have a little touch of that bronchitis or that uh, upper respiratory infection still lingering around. So he's doing that. I'm for I'm I'm fine with that. I'm for that if you're sick. But when I, what bothers me and what concerns me is when our leaders begin to tell us that you can't enter a store. See, I covered some of this on Wednesday nights. Not everybody's all, always here on Wednesday nights. But as we talked about it there, what we are seeing is a glo on a global scale, we've never seen it like what we saw it this year. Brother Jay, when they tell you, when they tell you you can't go to the store and you can't shop here, we, uh, Brother Curtis and some of his church, they, they came to town and, and some of his young people, they had a, a, a young people's retreat the last couple of days. And me and Amanda, we rode up to Gatlinburg with them. And we went up, we rode, we, we, they wanted to go ride the ski lift. So we was fellowshipping with them, we was going to ride this, that, that, uh, that yellow thing that goes up the side of the mountain. And then once you get up there, there's a sky bridge. And so we fought traffic and went with them and got up there. And we was outside. We was outside. Now I know there's a lot of people in Gatlinburg, you couldn't stir them with a stick. They so thick, but we was outside. And they said, you can't get off you can't get off this, this, this lift without a mask on. Now, I have a problem when they start telling me I can't go somewhere without a mask. I can't do this without a mask. You can't do that without a mask. You say, well, just put one on. Yeah, but that sounds and it seems, it reminds me of what it's going to be like when the Bible says that you'll not be able to buy or sell unless you got his mark. That's what scares me. That's what bothers me. And, and you say, well, it ain't the mark of the beast. No, but it's, give it, it's, it's really laying a foundation for when that time comes. When that time comes, they's a, I'm talking about that sinister agenda. Proverbs 29, verse number 12, the Bible says, If a ruler hearken to lies, all of his servants are wicked. We're talking about deception. We're talking about deception. Job 13, 3 through 5 says, Surely I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to reason with God, but ye... And I want you to notice what, what Job says to them men. He says, but ye are forgers of lies. Ye are all physicians of no value. Oh, that ye would altogether hold your peace, and it should be your wisdom. Can I say we have met a year where I don't deny at all that there's a new virus that's come to town. I realize that coronavirus is new, it's novel, it's what they call novel. I was reading, I was looking it up, there, for every virus that is known, there's different types of the flu virus, we understand that. It's got a, and I believe Miss Vicky can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's called a seriotype. Not a stereotype, but a seriotype for every virus. It's the it's the, the, the genetic makeup of that virus. And we understand that COVID-19 is different from the coronavirus that is on your Lysol bottle. So what has happened is that virus has mutated. And I say that the norovirus that causes the common, what we call the stomach bug that I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of. Now, if they, hey, listen, if there's a virus like that breaks out, you better mark it down. I'm buying me a hazmat suit. And I'll be preaching. I'll look like the Michelin man up here every Sunday. If there's a stomach virus breaks out like the coronavirus does, we'll cancel church for a year. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Amanda said, no, I'm not. I don't deny the fact that there's a virus. There's a real virus. There's really people getting sick with this virus because it's new. I remember in 2009, Papa Danny come pick me up. I was sick. Man, I was sick. Papa Danny come pick me up. And that was when the H1N1 scare, the swine flu was so moving so rampant through our country. Thousands upon thousands of people were getting sick. And Papa Danny, he come pick me up. 
took me to the doctor. I walked in. They shot fluid up my nose and sucked it back out real quick. They went and they done the test. They come back and said, you got H1N1, go home, don't leave. So I went home and I didn't leave. For seven days, I was sick. And it's bad. People, listen, Brother Bill, they were getting sick. People was dying. Man, it was, it was, it was what they described back then as an epidemic. It wasn't a pandemic. See, an epidemic is when it's regional. A pandemic is when it's global. So I understand that this ain't the first time that we have faced a novel sickness. Viruses mutate every so often. If the chicken pox ever did mutate again, we'd all end up with chicken pox again. If, if, if viruses, once you catch a virus, you, your body builds up antibodies. You become immune to that virus until either those antibodies, they wear out. And I'm no doctor. I've just been reading this stuff. And I didn't read it from one location. I read it from multiple locations. I knew this before coronavirus scare ever got big, but your body develops antibodies and over time those antibodies they will deplenish, they will be depleted but it takes years for that to happen and so long as your body has those antibodies you can't catch that virus again until it, unless it mutates. That's why in your lifetime you're, it's possible to catch the common cold multiple times but a lot of times you won't catch the same strain of that virus more than once in a short period of time. So we understand that the virus is real. There's some precautions that we should take. At the start of this year in March, I didn't know what to expect, Brother Bill. At the start of this year in March, I was uncertain. I was really fearful. But as I began to watch, as and I'm just going to name them off, the Center for Disease Control. They had put out numbers one week, and them numbers be be different next week. I watched the World Health Organization. They had say one thing one week and another thing another week. Politicians were saying, if you'll just give us two weeks uh, and you'll quarantine and wear a mask, we'll shut the government down for two weeks. Uh, oh, well, this virus will be behind us. We'll be able to recuperate and recover. But now here we are a year into this thing. And Brother Bill, I don't see any end in sight according to the media. Nothing's changed. But I don't deny the fact that the virus is real, but I believe with all my heart that it's been used to plunge our nation into fear. It's placed people in a position where everywhere you do, everything you do, everywhere you go, you should operate in fear. Now we're going to come back to that in a little while, but we see there's, there's a little bit of deception, I believe, because as I said there, when you look up the statistics, they're continually changing. And then you go, and, 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 and I looked this up. I, I did do the research on this. And I went back and I looked at the death rate in America. I saw this posted on social media. It sparked my curiosity. And I have a mind where I just Google something. I wanted to know how many people died the last four, five, six years. I wanted to get double check and see if what I read was true. <coughs> and, and the numbers state, Brother Bill, that when all is said and done, when we finish out 2020, the same amount of people, roughly, that died this year is the same amount of people that died last year and the year before and the year before that. When you look up the numbers, you'll find that coronavirus, as it relates to deaths in America, has not drastically changed the past statistics over the last four to five years. And the fatality rate of this virus that our nation, I believe, has been, has been used to fill our hearts and our minds with dread and with fear has a fatality rate of 0.2%. So less than 1% of all the people that contract the virus will it be fatal. And then we find that COVID has a 4% mortality rate among those that are 70 years and older. And if you look the numbers up, that's nearly 10% less than what the seasonal flu is among those that are 70 and older. 
And so what we're finding is the more that I've watched this virus as it has developed and the agenda that has been pushed upon you and I, it's been used to breed fear in the heart of individuals. And then I see secondly, there's not only the global deception, we're not being told the truth. The only truth that I find anymore that you can anchor your your trust in is this Bible. Amen. Amen. I'm getting to the point where I don't trust anything. And I listen, I'm not a big conspiracy theorist. I'm not, listen, out there. I believe the world's round. If you don't, that's all right. But I just believe it's round. I, I think that, you know, the moon's up there and God made the stars in the sky. And I'm just kind of normal like that. And I don't have no other reason to believe it any other way. I'm not, listen, trying to be odd tonight. I'm trying to encourage you and I. And I, I'll be honest, I'm trying to encourage those that are watching from home that, listen, we've not been told the truth. Amen. We've not been told the truth. I see there's, within this sinister agenda, it's growing division. Growing division. I believe we'd all say tonight that our nation's more divided than it's ever been. We're divided over race. We're divided over religion. We're divided, listen, over our, our policies. Political, listen, our political system's never been more divided than what it is in our day. But I want you to notice why the devil and these, the Antichrist spirit wants it that way. Jesus tells us this, Luke eleven seventeen. 17, but he, knowing their thoughts, saith unto them, every Kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every house divided against a house falleth. You know what the devil wants to see? The devil wants to see this nation devour itself. And I'm going to say something tonight, and I don't have an answer for this. I don't understand it, but I do believe it. When you look at Bible prophecy, when you look at Bible prophecy, you study out, I can find nations, I can find the nation of Russia, I believe you can find the nation of China, I believe, listen, you can find some of those Middle Eastern countries in Bible prophecy, no doubt you can find the nation of Israel in Bible prophecy, but nowhere do you find the nation of America in Bible prophecy. It falls, Brother, Brother Jay, it's not there. There's no type, there's no picture. You can see them coming from the north. They talk about people coming from the south. They talk about them surrounding nations. But Brother Bill, the nation of America is not found in Bible prophecy. I believe we can see the development of Bible prophecy being fulfilled around us in America today. As we've already made those statements, we can see the stage is being set. But for whatever reason, there's going to be something happening. I'm afraid. I'm afraid that one of those reasons is at some point our nation's going to implode from within. And I ain't talking about nuclear warfare. I'm just talking about this nation's going to fall apart. If we cannot come together, eventually, I, I heard a preacher preach one time and they said he was crazy. It's been over 10 years ago and they said he had lost his mind. They said he was crazy. They said it never happened. But the preacher got up and he preached on why I believe America is headed for another civil war. He preached that over 10 years ago. Amen. Look at us today. We're on the verge of it. We're on the verge. We're living in a time where families are even at one another over the policies and things that's going on around us. But see, that's what the devil wants. He wants it to be that way. And he's using Facebook, Twitter, so I'll say it like social media. He's using mainstream media. CNN will tell you one thing, MSNBC will tell you another, and then Fox News will tell you another. And if you listen to all three of them, you wouldn't know. Listen, you'd be at it with yourself. Because there's a growing division among the people in America. And I'm talking about the leaders tonight. There's some leaders, they want it that way. They want it that way because, see, when you... Global deception will produce a growing division. This all builds on each other. Global deception. You know, you know what Adolf Hitler said? 
if you tell a lie enough, they'll believe it. You know what Hitler did to his to, to people? He told them he told them the same lie enough until the point where everybody believed it. If you tell the people the same thing over and over and over and over, their minds will get to a place where they believe it. And he said, it doesn't matter how many lies you tell, as long as you get to victory. If you get to the victory, nobody will, nobody will wonder about the lies. That's what Hitler said. I see a lot of that same mentality among some of our leaders. Talking about leaders, global deception produces a growing division. And then when, when we get to a place where we're so divided, you know what happens? It makes us dependent upon the government, governmental dependence. We get so divided, so divided that then the government will have to step in. And governmental dependence, Revelation 13, I quoted this earlier, and he calls all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. This is talking about what's going to happen during the tribulation period. And we talked about the stages that are being set up when the Antichrist rises up and he sits upon the throne. He will be the governmental leader. He'll be the epicenter of the government. He'll have the answer for all of the governmental questions that mankind has. He will, he will be that one world ruler. He will. And at that time, they'll have to receive the mark in their right hand or their foreheads and that no man might buy or sell save that he had the mark or the name of the beast of the, or the number of his name. We know that number 666 is the number of the man. Six, three score and six. So we understand this evening that we have been brought to a place where when you depend on the government, when, you, when we get to a place where we have to depend upon the government, they have us. And listen, I'm not, I'm not calling for a militia. I'm not saying we need, but you know, what I've watched this year is when the government shut down, when business is closed, Brother Bill, do you know how what the statistics are? Brother Jay brought me a pamphlet the other night, and I read it. And thousands upon thousands of people in America, this ain't this ain't talked about. They don't say nothing about this, but you know how many thousands of people will starve to death this year because they lost their job, because they've been laid off. You say, man, that's pretty drastic. Yeah, but these business owners, these a friend of mine. I I I I. I I mentioned his name the other night. There's a friend of ours, and they fell on hard times, and couldn't have come at a worse time. And they're they're in a in a place that helps people that have fell on hard times get back on their feet. There's a man there that has nothing. He was telling me my my, my buddy was telling me this. He said there's a man there that has nothing, but he walked away from six figures a year because. Coronavirus pushed him out of his job. When they shut the government down and put everything to a halt, they lost everything. Now his wife and his children are living and they don't have anything to their name. Nothing. They're put in a position. The government wants us to be in a position where we have to depend on them. Y'all ever done something for somebody and they hold it over your head? I can't stand that. If I do something for you, or if you do something for me, don't, don't hold it over my head. But I know people like that, Brother Jay. I've asked them to come and help me, and then, you know, that's all they ever want to talk about. Well, you remember that one time I did this for you? It puts you in a position where you continually feel like you, you owe them something. You're indebted to them. I'm afraid that's what our government, some of the people within our government desires for you and I to feel like we depend on them, that without them we have no hope. Lastly, a spirit, the spiritual antichrist, they, they have influenced or they have developed or we've saw this sinister agenda this year. And it develops a satanic assault. I'm, I'm about done. I know we've been long, but a satanic assault. 
And there's a lot I could say about other things, but I'm just going to talk about the church here for just a little while. The church. There's an all-out war on the church. And I realize this evening that you and I are in Tennessee. We're not facing what other people are facing. But this year has been a year where governors, mayors, political leaders have said that you're not allowed to have church. They said that you're not allowed to gather together. You're not allowed to uh, worship together. If you worship, you can't sing songs. You can't, listen, the preacher needs to do this. I have read it all this year. Uh, and Brother Jay, it really, really just made me angry, if I'm being honest about it. Because they're saying we can't do when the very fabric of our nation, the documents that bind us together state that they can't make a law. And see, the thing about it is, Brother Jay, you got a lot of smart people that's operating with the spirit of Antichrist, and what they do is they find what we call loopholes. And they say, well, we're not going to make it a law. We're just going to call it a mandate. I'm going to be real honest with you this evening. I am about tired of hearing the word mandate. I'm about tired when I walk in uh, to any restaurant or business, they say, no, we're on the door. said, according to the county mandate. The Bible says this. There's, and I'm, I'm talking about the secular mandates that we've saw this year. These churches right now in California, and I know that's on the other side of the nation, but... If we're not careful, if some people don't stand up and say we've had enough of this, it can make its way across this nation and it'll be in our back door. Because see, the thing about some political figures, and I'm not saying all of them, because I know there's some good ones up there, but the thing about it is when you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. And I believe with all of my heart at the beginning of this thing, we gave them an inch and they've run with it. They've run with it. We see the secular mandates. They say, Brother Bill, well, you can't have church. Well, at the start of this thing, I was afraid. I didn't want nobody getting sick. I didn't want nobody. I don't want Brother Scott to say, I don't want anybody sick. I don't want anybody sick. I'd never do anything that I thought would intentionally get anybody sick. I would. And then, you know, at the start of this year, we tried to limit our time together because well, I didn't know. I really didn't know what was going to develop. And then it come on down through, you know, and then we got kindly back on a regular schedule, and then folks started getting sick. Well, I don't want other people to get sick. I don't want you to get it. We can avoid it. I mean, I believe in exercising common sense. I believe you can avoid getting sick at all costs while we need to. And so then, you know, another fear that I had, and this was in the back of my mind, is I was afraid that, all right, well, you know, we'll just tell the sick ones to stay home. We'll still have church. And then what I feared, though, Brother Bill, is the health department official walking in here and saying, well, we know that you've got active cases within your church and you've not really done much about it. Because then I would probably really say some things that a preacher shouldn't say. If they came in here and started telling us what we can can't do. And so, Brother Bill, they, I've been torn every which direction. But I tell you what would put a stop to a lot of this foolishness that we see is people just making their mind up that we're going to trust God. And I'm not talking about being foolish and being senseless. I'm not talking about, listen, I'm just talking about standing up and saying, no, we're, we're not going to let you do this. Because secular mandates, Acts 5, 25 through 29, Then came one, told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. The apostles had been thrown in jail and said, they, they, they released them, said, All right, we're going to let you go. Acts chapter number 5, we're going to let you go. But we don't want you teaching that Jesus doctrine anywhere in, in, around us. You've got to stop that. We're going to put a mandate on it. You ain't doing it. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence 
For they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And, they, and when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in his name? Behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than than men that's where we're at that's where we need to be if you ain't there comes a point in time where you got to say enough is enough we're going to obey God rather than men because men ain't going to judge us we're going to stand before God amen we're going to stand before a thrice holy God when they said we're going to give an account of the decisions that I've tried to make this year as, as a pastor I realize every decision I made I'm on, I, I'll stand accountable for them I'll stand accountable for what times we've had service and I'll stand accountable for what times we've not had service and I've tried my very best to do what I felt like was right but I believe we've reached a time and after I've watched everything that's transpired I believe it's time that we stand up and say enough is enough I've had all I can handle not only do we see the secular mandates and I'm just going to mention these and get down here I'm going to give you my three thoughts and I'm done social madness have you ever seen a year like it? What bothers me, Brother Bill, is they'll say that we can't have church. They'll say that, 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 that Christians can't go to the house of God and worship. But yet they don't close down the gentlemen's clubs. They don't close down the beer joints. They don't close down, listen, uh, the liquor stores. You can still go and buy. You can gather up at Lowe's and Home Depot. and You can do all those things, but you're not allowed to have church. That bothers me. That bothers me. Uh, when, listen, you can riot in the streets and they call it a peaceful protest, but they'll slap a fine on churches that want to just get together and worship God. That bothers me. When you can burn cities down and, and demolish buildings and desecrate, listen, monuments, and they say that's all in the name of a peaceful protest and they have that right to assemble uh, together, but yet you and I don't have the right to go to church. I have a problem with that. Social madness and senseless motives. And then, but what are we to do in this day? When we've been told to be fearful, when we've been told to do all these things and to be afraid of this virus, and be afraid of what's going on, what are we to do as God's people? Having faith in a fear-filled day, what are we to do? There's three simple thoughts and it took me all that time to get to these three simple thoughts. Number one, Matthew chapter number six, verse number 32 through 34. Number one, for after all these things do the Gentiles think. He's, he's talking about your daily needs. He's talking about your clothing, your raiment. He's talked about their food. Uh, he, he says, for all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things... Uh, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore, and this is what, what I want you to understand. The Bible says, take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. I, I, can I say, first of all, if we're to have faith in a fear-filled day, there comes a time where we have to fret uh, uh, not that what what the Lord is uh, talking about is the worries that you and I have. Uh, hey, listen, if you want to live in worry and if you want to live in fear, that's your uh, right to do so. Uh, uh, but I want to encourage us this evening, uh, uh, do not allow the prayer of our leaders and the motives that we see being pushed upon us to cause us to live in perpetual fear and worry. Worry. Do you know that I believe it's some like 73%, I know you can't always trust the percentages like this, but it's like 73% of everything we worry about never even happens. The majority of the things, and listen, I, I, I'm going to be telling you, I worry about everything. I'm worried, worried. I worry about all kinds of stuff. We all worry. But as it relates to the things we saw this year, quit worrying about it. Because the Lord, our Heavenly Father, knows every need that we have. And He's in control of everything. 
and they ain't nothing going to happen to you that God didn't already see was going to happen. You say, well, preacher, what if I get the virus? Well, if you get the virus, there's a great physician in heaven that knows right where you're at, that knows right what you're going through, and he knows the doctor better or knows the body better than any doctor. So don't worry about it. You say, well, I'm worried about whether or not if I get it, somebody else will get it. The Lord knows. Somebody might say, well, I know I've got, and I'm, I'm, I'm for exercise. I don't believe you ought to go around licking doorknobs. <laughs> I'm not for that. I'm not saying that. You say, well, preacher, I've got underlying issues. God knows every issue you got. He knows every issue you got. He knows every issue you got that you don't even know you got. And so if you do get sick, there's a God in heaven that knows. And they ain't every one of us getting out of this life alive. Amen. We all, one of these days, it's pointing on a man when you say, well, preacher, you preaching us in the ground. No, 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 I'm not. I don't want to see nobody get sick. But I do want to see our church people quit worrying about this thing so much. And I know that's pretty heavy. And, but I, I believe it's time that we quit worrying about it as much. I know you say, well, there's situations and things that you just trust the Lord. Just trust God. God knows what He's doing. God knows what He's doing with you. God knows what He's doing with me. God knows what He's doing with this church. And God knows what's going on in the world. We may not, but God does. Number two... 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. So we see in verse, in Matthew, we're to fret not. Quit worrying about things that's out of your control. Quit worrying about things that you, my, my growing up, I'm going to let y'all in on something. Growing up, I was a scared to death going to school. I cried until the eighth grade. I really did. I didn't cry in eighth grade. By then, I kind of growed out of it. But every morning, I'd get up. My mom would drop me off, but mom had to work, so my mom Susan would come pick me up. And every morning, every morning, and I'm not exaggerating, every morning I'd go, I'd get the telephone before we leave the house, and I'd call my mom Susan, and I'd wake her up. And I'd say, my mom, you going to be there today? And she said, yes, honey, I'm going to... She had never forgotten. I had never been left at school. But every day I'd call her. And I'd say, now, are you going to be there today? And I mean, it'd be summertime, but it'd be springtime. I'd say springtime, because we wouldn't be out for the summer. It'd be springtime. It'd be 80 degrees outside. And I'd ask her, well, what if it's snowing? You promise you're going to be there? And I said, well, what if it's raining? You promise you're going to be there? And I said, be sure to get there early and be first in line, okay? Because I want to see you when I come out the door. She said, all right, honey, I'll be there. Now, mind you, it was late summer. <coughs> she'd start picking me up. And then, you know, so I'd come out there, and she'd be the first one in line to go to the every day. She'd be the first one day in line. When I'd open that school door up, we was coming out for the car ride line. There she'd be, first in line every day. She never failed to be first in line. And I'd get in that car and I'd be just as smiling. And my mom would be over here with sweat rolling down her face, sitting in that hot car. And I mean, absolutely ringing wet with sweat. And I say, hey, mama, how are you? I'm good, honey. And then in the wintertime, she'd be bundled up, look like an Eskimo sitting out there because she was first in line. You know, she'd sit there with Brother Bill so long, she didn't want to waste gas. So she turned the car off, and it was either hot or it's cold. And every day I'd come out there, and there'd my mom be. And mom would always tell me, "Honey, what, what do you have to worry about? My mom has never forgotten. Quit worrying." So I say, "My mom was good, my mom, but she wasn't God." And I say, "God, I never forget about this. So quit worrying about things. Secondly, quit fearing things." <coughs> Don't fear. God has not given us the spirit of fear. God, listen, when you become fearful, whatever the Bible says is not of faith, is sin. So quit being afraid. Because the Lord said, I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of power.
but of a sound mind, but of power and love and of a sound mind. So quit fearing. Is my mom watching this? I figured, man, I seen him. I, I seen Amanda laugh, and I thought, well, mom's watching this, and she's. And lastly, listen, lastly, fret not, fear not, and thirdly, forsake not. Hebrews ten twenty five says this: not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching so much more as you see the day approaching not for, forsake not you're going to fret not quit worrying fear not quit fearing and then forsake not I miss and listen, I'm not getting on to anybody. I know there's been so much said this year, and I, I'm not being mean about it. And I know there's some that's watching from home this evening. But I want to encourage our church people that are at home. We need you in church. I want you back. There comes a point in time you've got to draw a line in the sand and say, look here, I'm going to trust God. I'm not going to let everything that we've heard and everything we've seen control my thoughts and my actions. I'm not going to allow everything that's been pressed upon us this year to keep me from going to the house of God. Because listen, I'm thankful that we're able to do, I thank God, you know, that we're able to live stream. I thank God that like Brother Donna, or Brother Donna, Miss Donna and Brother Terry, they're, they're on vacation. I want them to enjoy their vacation. But I'm thankful that when individuals go on vacation, they can tune in and watch our services and be a part of it. I think that's great. But I don't want people to stay home because they're fearful or because they're worrying because there's a God in heaven that's in control. And when we begin to evaluate those thoughts... <coughs> And when we see that a lot of what we've saw go on this year is motivated by Satan himself, it'll get you to a place where you realize, you know what, God's in control. And we need church, folks. We need church. I love you this evening. I appreciate everybody that come this way. And I hope that you'll take those thoughts as we roll down through them May you ponder them in your heart this week. And listen, if you didn't agree with everything I said, it's okay. But I believe we'll all agree that the Scripture says for us to fret not, fear not, and forsake not. Because there's no other way for us to have faith in a fear-filled day than to quit worrying about things that are out of our control. And quit fearing things that the world tells us to fear. And quit forsaking. We need the church. I love you. I appreciate you. If you'll stand together, if all hearts and minds are clear. Amen. Do pray. Listen, I understand people's been sick. People's still getting better. People's recovering. I don't want you to go home tonight and say, man, our pastor, he's crazy. He's lost his mind. Because I know people's been sick. But you hold on long enough, Brother Bill, we're going to end up with the flu. There's going to be some of us get the flu this year. There's going to be some of us get... As bad as I hate to say it, there's going to be some of us getting norovirus. There's going to be some of us end up with rhinovirus. That's the common cold virus. Uh, there's going to be some of us end up with bronchitis. There's going to be all kinds of sicknesses. But don't be afraid. Don't fear. I love you, and I appreciate you. Pray for those that are sick. Remember Miss Rhonda? As we get updates, we'll try to keep, keep everybody posted. I love you and I appreciate you. Brother Jay, if you will, dismiss us in prayer.